So, so throughout this, I'm going to obviously be doing a lot of talking, but I also want to try and get each and every one of you involved as, as much as possible. So I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions and I'm probably not going to be like, Hey, does anybody have any questions or does anyone have any points on this or whatever? I'm just going to pick people and, and kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, throw you under the bus. Um, <laughs> so, so we can kind of get everyone involved within this and, you know, we're all here to learn. We're all here to learn off each other. And I'm sure there are things that I'll learn off each and every one of you also. Um, so don't be afraid to kind of voice your ideas or your opinions uh, throughout this. And maybe some of those have changed or you've learned some new things from the articles that I've sent in the chat, but I would like to know some of the perspectives prior to reading those things as well. So don't necessarily let that influence you uh, right off into, into the first start of the, the mentorship. So uh, the first part, of this mentorship, we're going to be defining fitness. Now, fitness is a term that's thrown around a lot all over the place. You know, you see it in CrossFit, you see it in uh, different training spaces where they talk about this is the fittest or this is cardio or this is that. But I'd like to know from from one of you, what do you define fitness as? Um, I think it'd be quite interesting hearing from yourself, Nicole, obviously coming from, from your background. What, what do you define as fitness? <laughs> This is uh, probably not to jump onto the CrossFit definition of fitness. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. What is that? Um, oh my god, I can't even remember. It's just it's a what is like broad time demand or uh, yeah, it's course, something like that. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't really. Yeah, it's hard to understand. I think it's fitness is literally. I think it's just a mixture of being like cardiovascular, fit, strong, mm -hmm. and powerful. Mm -hmm. To me, that's. That's why it's, it's quite similar to CrossFit, but that's why I see it as. Yeah. Um, but then I think you can also, it really depends on what your sport is mm -hmm. and what, or, yeah, what you're trying to be fit for, I think. Yeah. D um, does any it's, just, it's so hard to define, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, but does anyone have anything different from that? Or we're all kind of in agreement that it's something along those lines of it's an all encompassing thing. Cool. All right. So, I guess we can look at this as being our, the, our fitness compass. Now, uh, the word or term fitness has probably been skewed a little bit by CrossFit. Um, again, I'm not against CrossFit in, in any way, but there are some things that kind of skew some stuff. And we look at uh, CrossFit being defined as fitness or the fittest doesn't necessarily mean that because we're not necessarily testing all of these fitness qualities or we think we are in an individual. Otherwise we'd need to do a whole bunch of different laboratory tests and things like that. So, so fitness is an all encompassing term of all of these different qualities from, you know, VO2 max, HRV, speed, power, mobility, strength, resting heart rate, threshold or critical power, however you want to look at it. And it's your ability to now apply these within your sport. So a powerlifter's fitness compass is going to look completely different to a cyclist's and completely different to a crossfitter's. They're all going to be different, but they're all going to have some sort of fitness for their sport. You know, whether it's a higher VO2 max for the crossfitter, but a higher strength for the powerlifter, no one is fitter or more unfit than the other in the actual term of fitness. They are just, are they fit for their sport? Does that make sense? Cool. So with that, um, following up on the, uh, what is fitness, that comes into the other side of the question being, what is conditioning? All right. Um, I'd like to hear from, from uh, Terrell, man. Do you have a kind of an idea on what conditioning is? Sorry, I couldn't quite get the last one. I don't uh, know the name, but... Yeah, I said uh, I'd like to hear what your, I guess, your thoughts around what is conditioning. Um, yeah, I guess it it kind of flows into what is fitness in in in, in, the, um, in some sense on how how your body's conditioned to certain movements or certain yep. um, modalities of fitness. I guess so, yeah. whether it's cardiovascular, but yeah. 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 Dennis, do you have anything else to add on that? So I had to unmute you. Not really. I mean, like, I don't want to steal the limelight here. Uh, I think we're nah. all going to have slightly, slightly different interpretations of conditioning. Yeah. Um, obviously me coming from a strength training background, uh, my, my view of conditioning is going to be very or starkly different to the crossfitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course the endurance athlete too. So I think what Terrell said there was yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, um, when we look at like fitness and conditioning, we can say fitness is all of those things all encompassed in terms of our, you know, speed, power, strength, resting heart rate, 
VO2 max, all those things, right? That is our, our fitness as a human. And that's kind of, we all have these qualities individually at differing levels. Now, our conditioning is actually our ability to apply those things within our sport or within our, uh, I guess, our chosen modality or our chosen field. You know, it's like we might possess all of these qualities of speed, power, strength, endurance, VO2 max and whatever, but now it's like as the as the CrossFit athlete or as the the cycling athlete, we now have to be able to apply those to our task and also within the environment that we're that we're competing or we're training in. And that's what's made up of our conditioning. Our conditioning is actually our ability to take those fitness qualities and now express them within our domain. All right. So with that, we have our individual constraints when we're looking at this uh, this graph here, and that comes down to our structure and our individual function. And then we also have our environmental constraints. Now that could be something as simple as, you know, we, the footy season, say we've got a footy player, they usually compete around, you know, a time of year. What's the weather like around that time? Are they conditioned to that environment? Can they show up in that environment and not have any uh, issues arise? And then task constraints can be things like the skills that are actually involved in that sport. So we could look at CrossFit is, you know, has like ring muscle ups, all those different tasks and skills that they have to be able to apply and do. Or we can look at it on the side of uh, use, using sport again. Um, you know, they don't practice, footy players don't practice their kicking within the gym. It's like the task constraints of their sport will be on the field with the field coach where they're practicing all the kicking and things like that. And then they take it and they put it all together. That is kind of what encompasses conditioning. So conditioning is essentially we take all of those those fitness qualities and now it's your ability to actually go and apply that within your sport. Um, and for, for the CrossFitters, we can look at it in, in this way. We hear CrossFitters called the fittest on earth. We've all heard that term, right? Um, but if we look at it in the terms of what fitness actually is, well, we're not actually on the field measuring anyone's VO2 max. There's no like genuine heart rate testing. There's no genuine maximal strength testing, any of those things. And now we also have environmental constraints of, oh, this person has come from a cold environment. Now they're in Madison where it's really hot. They're not used to that, okay? So they can't actually apply their fitness to a higher level, all right? And then there's all the skills as well. So we could probably say that in those terms, a CrossFitter is the most conditioned or the best person is the most conditioned to that environment in those tasks under their own individual constraints. But we don't necessarily know that on paper they are the fittest because they are slightly different things, all right? Now, what we're going to talk about in this mentorship, we're not really going to talk about environmental or task constraints. We're going to dive more into the uh, physiological side and a little bit of the anatomical side, looking at uh, energetics um, in terms of function and then structure in terms of anatomy, how that affects someone's performance and how we can actually um, plug and play little things within training to see and create change within the people that we are trying to apply it to. Now, Today, we're going to be diving into all of the underlying stuff. So like I said, the, the anatomy and the physiology, and that's just so we have that base understanding before we move into kind of the nuts and bolts of it in the next two uh, two calls where we're going to dive into things like programming and testing and, and all the fun stuff. So the first thing we're going to dive into, obviously, we're looking at individual constraints of structure and function. I want to touch on structure. And, and when I talk about structure, I'm actually talking about uh, anatomical structure. So looking at our axial skeleton, how that actually affects our appendicular skeleton and uh, how that affects our performance within our chosen sport. Now, has everyone heard the, the term structure dictates function? Yep, some people. No, so, so that term basically just means how we present in terms of like our potential posture will affect the way that we function. And we can kind of give a crude example of this, of everyone's seen a, a bodybuilder or a powerlifter that's, that's really extended in kind of this position of like shoulders back and down, chest out. Yes. Everyone's seen that. All right. So what I want everyone to do, we're, again, this is crude. This is not exact, but I want you to all kind of push your chest out and squeeze your shoulder blades back and down as hard as you can. All right, now I want you to try and take in a really deep breath. All right, now exhale. All right, now kind of slump over a little bit in your chair, get comfortable how you'd probably naturally sit every day. Now try and take in a deep breath. Which one was easier? 
someone, anyone. Second one. The second one. The second one. Cool. Anyone? Did anyone find the first one easier? Yeah, me. <laughs> That's because I'm. Yeah, it's it's because you're already there, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll talk about that soon. But yeah, so so that's our structure, right? So that person could come in and present a little bit more like that. We seeing that we can be like, oh, maybe they're not going to be as functional, so to speak, within these tasks. So we need to make some change to that structure, maybe to fit this sport or whatever that might be. But that'll kind of happen naturally with our potential exercise selection. But this is just a, a crude example of structure and how that can actually affect things. Because it's like you take that person that presents in that extended posture, all right, let's say that powerlifter and that uh, or that um, bodybuilder, let's not worry about their actual levels of cardiovascular fitness, but how do you think they're going to go breathing doing some type of cardiovascular activity? they're going to find it much harder because of the structure that they present themselves in. All right. And, and on the other side of the, the story, uh, the person that's a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more slumped over, they're probably going to fall on the scale of someone who's going to find it a little bit easier. Um, but while I dive on structure, I'm not going to go too far into this. I think a really good person that I've luckily got on this call to take it a little bit deeper will be uh, Dennis. So I'm going to throw him under the bus um, because he is a guru when it comes to um, the anatomy of uh, humans. So I'd like to get his take on structure and it'll obviously open up that lens for you guys a little bit more and give him the opportunity to kind of tell you. All right. Thanks, Louis. Uh, I, I just want to start off by asking you, Louis, yeah. uh, what, what is it that you want me to explain? I would like you to explain the effects that the rib cage and pelvis have on the skeleton right. and how okay. that can affect human movement. Cool. Okay, cool. So, so when Louis talks about structure, he mentioned it just before that how the uh, axial skeleton, which is what you're looking at on the screen right now, the axial skeleton is going to be from the cranium down to the pelvis. That's what we're going to talk. And that's going to be the axial skeleton. The appendicular skeleton is going to be the limbs, the arms and the legs. Now, the presentation at which the axial skeleton finds itself in is going to either impose a limitation or it's not. So what I mean by that, if we look at the app, uh, the uh, axial skeleton of the strength biased person right here on the far right, we have a rib cage where the sternum is up. As a result of that, we see a coupled motion at the pelvis with an anterior orientation. Now, what that automatically tells us is this person here with this skeletal representation is going to have a hard time accessing an overhead position, accessing a deep hip flex position, and they're probably going to fail at ankle mobility as well. So this is going to be a person that's going to be very, very good at tolerating heavy loads and expressing maximal forces. On the contrary, or sorry, on the converse, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we have the endurance-based athlete. Now, it's not to say that a powerlifter or a strength athlete can't adopt this position. They very well can. But typically speaking, uh, an endurance-based athlete is going to probably live in this skeletal representation. As a result of that, an endurance-based athlete needs to have what's called reciprocity between the left and the right sides of their body. An endurance-based athlete needs their legs to move in harmony with one another, left and right. They need to access the frontal plane. They need to access the transverse plane. And they need to do so efficiently so they can sustain prolonged periods of work, hence endurance athlete. So I hope that gives you something. And Lou, you can tell me if you want to go a little bit further in terms of how the skeletal representations can imply or impose movement limitations. No, that was perfect, Dennis. That that covers that, and and we will dive a little bit deeper into structure in the next um the next module. This was more just giving everyone a little base understanding of of the effects our structure actually can have, and the presentation that someone might come to you with, and how that can actually affect everything else that they're doing. So it's not necessarily always looking at someone's fitness qualities being, you know, VO2 max, resting heart rate, strength, speed, power. It can also be how they actually present to you. Yes, Dennis. Did anyone have any questions on that? Because that I think like if you've never heard of this, uh, of, of the skeleton being spoken about like that, it might just go over your head and be like, what the hell was that? Did anyone have any questions? Because it is a relatively foreign topic. Yes. I got one. Yeah, yeah, go for it, John. Uh, so what actually keeps a person's skeleton in 
any of these positions? Like, why is the strength person stuck in that position and the endurance person in that position? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Are, are you familiar with this at all, by the way, John? Uh, kind of, like a uh, very tip of the iceberg with that. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm asking that because of which kind of words I might use here. If we look at the strength bias athlete, someone who is loading axially quite frequently, can we agree? Uh, back squatting, bench pressing, we're presenting... Think of a bench press, you know, a, bre a bench press de demands an arch. It demands you to force this position, correct? Yeah. We've got a low bar squat that with a barbell sitting on our back, which means that we need to raise the sternum up to, to compromise so that we, so we can balance ourselves, right? And then we're, 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 the, the environment that we find ourselves in so frequently and the task that we're doing in that environment, both of these things to uh, combined mean that our, our skeleton is going to start to adopt this position. It's, the, it's adopting a position based on the task that we impose upon it so regularly. Does that, does that clarify that one? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, if I can yeah. go, like, ask a follow-up to that, um, just briefly, what, like, is it um, the muscles putting that skeleton in that position? Uh, like connective tissue, like a, like at a microscope level, like what's uh, actually holding it there? If we were to take a granular level, of course, muscles are going to be shortened in a position that it's going to hold that position. Um, but it's not just the muscles that influence it. If you think of, so the strength, the strength skeleton, if you will, uh, a, a strength athlete is very, very good at taking a massive breath and holding it, Right bracing, intra-abdominal pressure, et cetera, et cetera. We, we are doing this so regularly, we start to adopt this position of a rib cage flared. We're always in an inhalation biased skeleton, okay? So that's the first thing to think about. That's the, that's the one thing that's like the starting point. The second point is then going to be the start or the, the, the task that we impose on the body, the barbells, the heavy force production, et cetera. That's the second thing. Okay, And then the third thing is, as a result of those two things, we then start to see a posterior musculature from cranium down to the Achilles in a shortened concentric orientation, i.e. tight, stiff. So it's almost like we're finding ourselves in that position because of all of those three things combined. Cool. Thanks, Dennis. That's okay. Cool. Yeah, cool. So as you can see, the side of structure is a, is a super, uh, we can go into a lot of depth with it. And what Dennis was talking about a little bit there when it was, when it comes down to, uh, is what's called like biotensegrity and, and length tension relationships and the effects that they also have on the skeleton. And that's some things that we will touch on in the, the next, um, next week, uh, in terms of, what manipulating that might look like and how those or how tension actually affects um, whether it's skeletal change, but also the effects that the exercise we do has on tension. All right. So we will dive into that a little bit more. Um, does anyone have any questions on structure? Because it's a super dense uh, topic, um, but, but we can come back to it later on because we still got a fair bit to go. No? Awesome. All right, so we've touched on structure. Now, the other side to that was function, all right? And, and today, function, I'm going to be talking about uh, more on the side of energy systems and, and muscle fibers. Now, when we talk about energy systems, it's a very broad term. Like everyone's like, I'm training my aerobic system. I'm training this. I'm doing that. What does that actually mean? Well, we can look at energy systems is, is simply the, the breakdown and the restructure of ATP, all right, to produce muscular contraction. That's that's really all it is. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of processes in between um, that are really complex, but they're not really that necessary to know the ins and outs of it. But essentially, all that is, is it's ATP, oh, sorry, yeah, ATP being broken down into energy, and then it's being rebuilt again, so we can use it as energy again, so we can keep contracting a muscle, all right? Does anyone have any questions on that? We're going to dive a little bit deeper into it. Okay, but that's kind of the ins and outs of how far you need to know of, of what that is um, without going into things like the Krebs cycle and understanding all that stuff. Who has seen this before? Most people who have done anything in terms of like a certificate or anything, we've seen something similar in terms of like this system works for this time, this system works for this time. If you're training a sprinter, they're going to do most of their work uh, in this section here. If you're training a endurance athlete, it's all going to be down here. Now with this, um, 
does anybody has anybody ever seen or or thought that there's anything wrong with this this presentation of uh, uh of what's the word uh this this picture like this picture of energy systems has anyone ever seen anything wrong with that Nicole I'm sure you would have seen this plenty of times in your degree maybe <laughs> yeah yeah. Is it, does um, this give you any red flags or anything like that or make you question things? Yeah, they would have taught it a lot in my degree, but I don't know. It just seems it's just too simple. Like it mm. just doesn't, it's just not as easy as that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And look, to an extent it, it is, it can be this simple, but at yeah. the same time it can afford us to miss a lot. All right. And, and in terms of that is, is, you know, when I first saw this back when I first started learning, um, you know, training conditioning and all these things, I had that, that same dissociative view. I'd be like, Oh, I'm training a endurance athlete. So all I need to do is I need to sit down here, but I, I didn't actually think about or, or understand or know the effects that these two also have on this. All right. And that comes down to, this dissociative lens, all right, this was created, I couldn't tell you a date, but an extremely long time ago when the tools that we had in a lab to measure, you know, the the times of, of these systems working together was extremely slow. But what we now know through through tests is as soon as your muscle contracts, all of these systems are working together within 150 milliseconds. Every single one of them, they're working together in some way. All right, they're not. One's not starting, and it's working on its own. Has anyone ever done that test um, where I don't know, like your coach or something, will be like, "We're going to show you the alactic system," and then you'll feel when the anaerobic system takes over because you'll just feel that wall where you'll slow down a little bit. Has anyone done that, or is that just me? No, nah, that's just me. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so. It doesn't work like that. Yes, there are things that are happening where you might slow down a little bit and something else will happen. But even in that time when you're sprinting, all of these systems are working together. That's kind of the main thing that we need to understand. And all of them have something in common. All right, that is oxygen. Okay, we've got our three systems, our uh, alactic, anaerobic lactic, and our aerobic, but they are all linked in some way. I'm sure everyone's heard the term anaerobic. Yes. Yeah, at some point, what does anaerobic mean? John, can you tell me? Not requiring oxygen. Not requiring oxygen. Yeah, cool. Does anyone here truly think that that we are ever without oxygen? Nah. If 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 we were without oxygen, we'd be dead. Really got like that's that's as simple as that. Our muscles were never are never without oxygen, even when they're completely depleted. They have some left. Well, now, yeah, I've got a question. It, yeah. If you go back to that previous slide. Mm -hmm. Genuine curiosity here. Mm -hmm. Why is it that, um, al although you're saying that this, like, you know, traditional model is old and it's it, it wasn't as contemporary as what it could be because we have now better facilities to test these things and measure them. Why why do people still so strongly believe that you know anaerobic lactate training is you know without oxygen? Why does that have any merit? I think it's just it's just outdated language that's still used. You know, it's like the same language where you see the same people running around going, Oh, you've got a lactic acid buildup in your muscle. But it's like, we, we knew that wasn't the case years ago, yet we still use it. We know that lactic acid or lactate is actually a form of energy that we reuse within our system. And just because it's something we've used as a measurement of um, where your system is presenting at a certain time, we now relate that to that time being, oh, that's what's causing the pain because that moment when it measures higher, you're in a little bit more pain, but it's just a, a wrong association. So I think it's just a, you know, whether it's too hard to change the language because it's so indoctrinated already and, and it's, it's a harder thing to do to then reteach all these people these things. And it's also at the level of, it's not, you know, this dissociative model it's not entirely incorrect. It just forces us to overlook a lot of things. Like there's nothing completely wrong with it and it doesn't not work. Like if you just want to roll with the, the dissociative model and go, I'm just going to do aerobic training for my, you know, endurance athlete and they're going to get better aerobically. They probably are. But that's the same as taking that power lifter and go, I'm just going to keep giving them heavier and heavier loads and training. And they're, all they're going to do is SBD and no other accessories. They're probably still going to get stronger. But is that the best way for them to get stronger? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's all it comes down to. It's not saying that it's wrong. There's just other things that it overlooks. And 
without diving deeper into your own uh, education and own understanding, you'll miss all those things that, that you could be applying to actually supplement that training a little bit more to make it more beneficial for the person that you're working with. Uh, so when contraction stops, so has anybody heard of Moxie or seen Moxie before? Um, so Moxie, again, I'm not diving too much into it. Basically, it's a device um, that reads uh, oxygen saturation at the level of the muscle. Okay, so we have um, SpO2, which I'm sure a lot of people would have heard of in terms of like, say when you go to the doctor and they, they put that little thing on your finger and it reads the oxygen level in your blood. Everyone's seen that before. You've also got them on like Apple watches and things like that. Well, these devices, you place them on a muscle, okay? And it actually reads how much oxygenated blood or how much oxygen is attached to the hemoglobin within that muscle itself, all right? And that can give us ideas of what's happening during contraction. Now, with these, I've used them before and they're a really cool device, but again, for most of you or nearly all of you, I'll say it, not really applicable, but they give us that cool information of what's actually happening at the level of the muscle during work. And that brings us back to uh, this side of the thing of, of what happens. Okay. So when we contract a muscle, we have three different things that happen. Okay. We have muscle compression. So that's basically if you take your arm and you do that, all right, there's a compression response at the muscle. All right. And that's essentially just that contraction that's pulling blood in and pushing blood out at the muscle as well. When we start working a little bit harder, uh, I'm sure you've all had like a little bit of a pump before. That's venous occlusion, all right? That's when we're getting fresh blood into that muscle and that's when we can still contract, all right? But blood's not leaving, okay? It's not leaving and there's a few things that are affecting that, which we'll talk about later in terms of blood pressure and a sympathetic response. Um, and then we go onto the other side or the far end of the spectrum being arterial occlusion. And that's when no blood is going in or no blood is going out. And that's most of us never really go there, but has anyone had like an extremely disgraceful pump where they just can't move their legs or their arm or something and it's burning, it's extremely painful and they can no longer do any more reps. That's essentially pretty close to that point of arterial occlusion. All right. And that's when muscle oxygen saturations are extremely low. And that's when we know that we can no longer contract, all right? Because the only time we will lose the ability to contract is when muscle oxygen levels are close to zero, okay? So if that's the case, all right, then those anaerobic pathways that exist, or well, we should still be able to contract, right? Because, you know, we can create energy without the presence of oxygen, but we actually can't, okay? And that'll kind of lead into the next few parts of why that's important to understand and it's important to know. So like I said, oxygen is the link. It's always present and it's always needed. Okay, we spoke about anaerobic processes and anaerobic processes are not non-existent. Okay, so the breakdown of ATP within the phosphocreatine system, for example, that breakdown does happen without oxygen. However, the resynthesis of PCR, we need oxygen for that to actually happen. Okay, so without oxygen, PCR wouldn't exist in the first place to break down. Okay, so that's why we still need that constant supply. Otherwise, we cannot resynthesize that that PCR. Same with when it comes to to lactate. Okay, uh, there's a thing called the lactate shuttle, and basically, it's when we have an accumulation of lactate within our in our muscle, it gets shuttled to a different uh, non-working muscle where it can be broken down by oxygen all right, to create more ATP. So there's a few things there, but basically, all we need to take away from this is oxygen is the link, okay, that keeps all of these systems together, and that they are working all the time. Okay, within 150 milliseconds of one another together to create ATP in some shape or form. All right. Does anybody have any questions? I've brushed over a lot in a pretty short period of time. Um, anything at all uh, on this topic at all of, I guess, that older model of energy, energy systems and I guess the link of oxygen and how that oxygen is our main, uh, is, is what's our main ability to contract. It's our main cause of contraction. We need it present. Everyone's all over it. Cool. All right. So we'll jump into the next part. Obviously, we've spoken about what energy systems are in terms of, you know, we've got our three main energy systems. They all need oxygen to work and they all work together at a similar time. Okay. We know that we've covered that so far, but now we've got to understand where are they? And 
like I said earlier, it's kind of a, it's a weird thing, right? Someone will go in and be like, yeah, I'm training my aerobic system today, or I'm training my glycolytic system today. Uh, I'm training this today, but where are they actually located? What are they? Tiff, I'm going to throw you under the bus. You got to unmute. All right, Jess, you're up. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> I was waiting on tip for that one. Where are your energy systems located? Uh, it's not a trick question, but it is something that not a lot of us think about. When I think of that question, I think of my clients and he's like, we should be training an aerobic system. Yep. And he's like, it feels like fucking anaerobic. I am dying. My muscles are killing me. And we've mm -hmm. gone way past that, even though we're training and we're classically his mm -hmm. aerobic system should be on paper mm -hmm. but for him it feels anaerobic okay so cool. is that has that answered your question no but you're kind of no. getting your your lead you kind of touched on it a little bit so we're asking about like the location like where do they where do they exist within your body because i like i said you said i just then oh we're training his aerobic system but he's feeling anaerobic but but what does that actually mean like what are you training where do they where do they sit are they in your brain are they I don't know, actually. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I'm she gonna say muscles. Friend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. my, I'm gonna assume our muscles. That's yes. my guess straight off yes. the bat. Cool. Awesome. Your muscles nailed it. Cool. And you did kind of say that. You said he's not feeling this. He's feeling this in his muscles. All right. So yes, our our energy systems are located within our muscles. They're in our muscle fibers. They're essentially where the energy is created. That's where contraction happens. And obviously there's a few things down the chain that support these things happening. Okay. Um, but everyone would have seen, or most of you would have seen something similar to this before in terms of our, our type one, two, a two B fibers and kind of what they do. Has anyone not seen or heard of our, our muscle fiber types before? No, we're all over it. Cool. Well, again, when, when we look at the, the science, uh, if you want to dive deep down, there is many, many more different muscle fiber types, but these are kind of the, the easy ones to, to kind of make it a little bit simpler and a little bit easier to look at and spread across the three different, but there are a whole bunch more, um, but we don't really need to know about them too much. This kind of gives us a, a broad enough view, but obviously there's the three types. There's our slow oxidative, our fast oxidative glycolytic and our fast glycolytic okay um with those it's essentially meaning when our aerobic system is working we're working at a slower pace hopefully we are using more of these fibers okay that's kind of what we're trying to train so we're trying to recruit those okay and that's kind of what you were saying just before jess how you said your client was trying to train their aerobic system but all our feeling was uh anaerobic right Again, sensation's kind of a hard one to go off, um, but that could be an indicator of maybe we aren't training the right muscle fibers, all right, for that system. Okay. Everyone would have seen this as well at some point, but but basically we don't need to know too much about this, but essentially just some muscle fiber characteristics and and what they come along with in terms of, you know, our now, slow type one muscle fibers are much more aerobic. All right. And then they kind of go across. What I was going to show you here is a little bit another graph, but I don't know where it went. Um, but basically, each of these muscle fibers, when they were originally measured, they have a, uh, a frequency response time. And it's actually quite interesting because those response times of, of fiber response times actually match that model, uh, that older model, Dennis. So I know you were asking before, like, where did that come from? Why hasn't that changed? So the response time of muscle fibers on the graph when they were first tested, it actually matches all right, the response time that is shown on those old models of energetics. So I don't know if there's a cross parallel there of someone's just made a, oh, yeah, this kind of fits and they've pasted it over. But that's what I was going to show you here, but I can, I can bring that up next time. This is kind of the main thing that we wanted to talk about when it comes down. Has anyone heard of the size principle? No. John, are you nodding? Yeah, I've heard of Henneman's size principle. Yeah, yeah cool. It. Do you care to try and have a crack at explaining it? Uh, yes. So motor units are like bundles of, of muscle cells. Mm -hmm. um, and some are bigger and stronger than others. Mm -hmm. As you like just, just moving around doing easy things, like you use the smaller ones mm -hmm. uh, as you fatigue or 
you require like um, more and more force production. You use larger and larger ones. So the the smaller ones are exhausted first, and then mm -hmm. the larger ones are recruited uh, later on when the smaller ones are exhausted or can't produce enough force. Is how I understand. Yeah. It. Yeah, perfect. That that's essentially exactly it. So, um, as you can see on this chart here, we've got uh, activation threshold up here and and force production. Okay, uh, force production could be like load, it could be speed or intensity, something like that. And activation threshold is just what's being recruited, right? At what at what uh, time? So, like uh, John was saying. When we start doing things, even just sitting here, me moving my arms, or I'm using energy systems, right? I'm using muscle fibers, probably type one, because it's relatively low intensive. It's really low load for me to do this. Now, as I'd start getting more, and let's just say I started jogging nice and slow, okay? I'd still kind of hope, or unless I'm extremely unfit, that I'm recruiting, all right? my type one fibers, all right? As I start increasing pace, okay? And going faster and faster and faster and the, the force production and the fatigue is increasing, these fibers are going to start contracting as well. And then if I was to go into an all out sprint, okay, well, I'm going to have to start recruiting more and more and more to keep going. And that's when, okay, my type 2B, might start uh, contracting and firing to keep me going. Same thing in the gym. If you start out with an extremely light load and then you start increasing that load in kilos or pounds or whatever you use until failure, you're going to start down here. And as the load gets more and more and more and more, we're going to be recruiting up here. Now, this is good to know. And, and this is where the whole... Um, We'll talk a little bit deeper into this when it comes to our programming exercise selection side of things. But when we look at this, it's like, does anybody, does this give anyone a bit of an idea of when it comes to exercise selection for conditioning? What would that mean? What would that mean to them? Um, Nicole, I'm going to ask you. Um, no, I don't, to be honest, I don't actually quite understand it too much okay, in terms cool. of exercise selection. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, cool. So, um, Mudge, do you want to have a do you want to have a crack? Can you share the question again? I've got a memory of a goldfish. <laughs> so, uh, looking at this chart and the understanding of this chart, if you don't understand it or re-explain it, that's okay. How would this affect your, uh, say, exercise selection for some conditioning? If I choose an activity that I might not be as efficient as, mm -hmm. it's going to cause a lot more. Uh, I can call it vasoconstriction, so a lot more blood flow. And if I'm not efficient at it, well, then I'm quickly going to be, I'm going to quickly become inefficient at it. And it's going to not really give me the, you know, the set adaptation that I'm after. Mm. Dennis, did you have anything different? Uh, for, for Nicole, uh, I, it's not a question for you, Nicole. I just want to, I just want to help you here um, because we're both learning alike. But say, Nicole, we have a, a conditioning piece um, and it's going to be a conditioning piece that's going to go between 15 and 30 minutes. We might look at that as an aerobic Mm. right potentially and now we've got the inclusion of a deadlift yeah but we've got the inclusion of a deadlift at a weight that is forcing us to actually recruit more muscle fibers than what's needed right because the weight on the bar is maybe a little bit too heavy for us and then we're starting to recruit more muscle fibers we're recruiting the two b's we're, we're, we're recruited the ones and the twos and the two b's but we're trying to yeah. work aerobically but the thing is if we're recruiting the two b's we don't want to be doing that because we can't sustain long periods of work by doing yeah. so, right? So we've got to decrease the weight of the bar or perhaps choose an exercise that's not the deadlift, for an example. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, then that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Perfect, Dennis. Um, so this is very applicable to a, a CrossFit um lens in terms of how they how we program uh metcons or wads or whatever you want to call it or if you're just a whether you're a strength athlete and you like to program uh different exercises within a conditioning piece itself or a cardio piece itself because sitting on a bike is extremely boring okay we understand that okay i want to work my aerobic system all right but we now need to understand what muscle fibers am i actually training here okay because that's going to affect my exercise selection Okay, because and on that as well, someone like uh, Dennis, who is is far potentially far strong, definitely far stronger than me, his exercise selection could look different because he's he can lift more than me, so maybe he can do something a little bit heavier, all right, with these muscle fibers than I can. Okay, before these start to be recruited. 
Okay, so this is where the individualization side of things comes into and, and understanding where your athlete is at to give you an idea of what exercises you may give them within a conditioning piece itself to actually target the muscle fibers or the energy systems that we are trying to hit. Instead of, a, I guess, a traditional CrossFit workout, which might be like, yeah, we're about here for a minute. Now we're about here for three minutes. Now we're about here for 30 seconds. Now I have to rest. All right now we're going to start again here, here. Does that make sense? Instead of just going, oh, I'm working this system and I'm just sitting here for this, this eight minute duration or whatever. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. Cool. Awesome. All right. So this also comes back to, um, and again, we'll touch on this a little bit within our exercise selection and programming side of the house. But another thing to understand and know is the innovation of these muscle fibers are from two different uh, systems. So um, when it comes to our nervous system, has everyone heard of uh, the term sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system? Uh, Terrell, have you heard of the parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system? No, I was just about to say I haven't. That's okay. So have you heard uh, the term uh, fight or flight or, or rest and digest? Yeah. yeah. So so um, essentially when it comes to our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system, there's two parts to it. There's our, our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight. So it's a, a bit more of a stress response. Okay. And then there's our uh, rest and digest. So when it comes to like doing recovery, sleep, digesting, relaxing, essentially, that's more our, our parasympathetic drive, okay, or our, our parasympathetic system, nervous system, okay, and and these two are kind of like, they're like switching between one another throughout our everyday life through the things that we do, um, and the, the muscle fibers that each of these systems innovate are different, right, so our parasympathetic system innovates more of our type 1 muscle fibers like we've spoken about, and our sympathetic nervous system innovates more about our type 2B and there's probably a bit of a mix between both for our, for our two A's. Okay. We won't dive into this too much just yet, but where this is important is it comes down to the side of skill, right? So when, especially within CrossFit, we have a lot of high skills in terms of stuff we throw into conditioning with like snatches, ring muscle ups, bar muscle ups, all those things. Okay. Now, when we're not very good at something, what's the response that we kind of have there? in terms of uh, the sensation that we feel around it. Is it, are we really happy? Are we comfortable? It's easy. Or if it's really complex and it's hard, uh, what kind of response does that kind of give us, Mudge? We are not happy. We're not happy. Yeah. So it we're... becomes uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. So it, it probably brings out a little bit more stress. Okay. And, and with that, what, what do you think the onset of more stress brings on to in terms of uh, nervous system high, response? High muscle tension. Yeah, so you cool. get a you get a up like a an upregulation of your nervous system. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and we're, so we're probably going to get a little bit more sympathetic drive. Yeah, right. Yes, Dennis. Oh, uh, just a quick inclusion. Now that we're talking about this, uh, John, we we're talking earlier about structure, and we we're talking about powerlifters, and how powerlifters have a high tension sort of skeletal representation. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, so so powerlifters and like just really strong people in general live in like a not I'm gonna say a permanent state of parasympatheticness, but live in a higher degree of sympatheticness. Um, because we're always got like a lot of tension going on globally. And so it's very, very hard for us to actually deal with aerobic training and get better at it. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I guess I guess with that, uh with yourself, Nicole, let's take a, a ring muscle up, for example, pretty complex movement, but let's take someone who is an advanced CrossFitter and someone who is not so much of an advanced CrossFitter and they find the skill quite difficult, but they can maybe string a couple together. What do you think yeah. these two people or these two archetypes are going to be, I guess, presenting differently within a workout when we look at these two things here? Um, well, you probably if you have those two athletes, you probably train in different energy systems. Yeah, because it, it's the ability to, to take a complex skill. Yeah, exactly right. So it's like the more complex skills, all right, the more sympathetic drive that potentially comes behind that, which will usually mean the more recruitment of those larger muscle fibers. Okay, so we could potentially have, because really a ring muscle up is, is a body weight movement. Okay, someone who is quite proficient at it, there's nothing saying they couldn't 
okay do them with aerobic aerobic fibers or type one fibers Mm -hmm. okay but someone who is not proficient at them and it stresses them out they string a few together they're in a much heightened state of of sympathetic drive they're not down here they're recruiting these muscles here all right so that's kind of where the nervous system ties in a little bit in terms of we've gone down that route of cool these are the systems this is where they're located they need oxygen all right they all work together okay they're located at our muscle fibers. We have these three types and they are recruited in this order and they are innovated by these two systems being the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. Again, this is a lot that I'm covering and this is all the underlying stuff that we need to kind of have a bit of an understanding before we go and dive into things like exercise selection and prescription and time domains and testing and all those kinds of things. On the nervous system, has anybody got any questions at all um, moving forward? How are you going over there, Nadine? Being very quiet. <laughs> no, I'm going. Everything's good. Everything's okay? Cool. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, so what? Okay. I kind of just touched on that. I forgot to click next. Good. <laughs> um, so so to train our muscles, okay, we know that we need what? Who can who can tell me? Tiffany, have you figured out how to unmute? <laughs> we need oxygen just nod yes okay cool so to train our muscles we know that oxygen needs to be sufficient all right we've also learned where they're located all right how the exercises we choose may affect that in terms of force production okay and how the exercises that we choose may affect things like the nervous system which will then affect motor unit recruitment and again the system that we are trying to train all right so Now we've looked at all of those things. This is all the underlying stuff. So we have our energy systems and they are located within our muscles. And now we know we need oxygen. All right. So there's now a few steps in the way that we need to also understand to know or to understand that we are going to be able to get, where is it? A sufficient supply of oxygen. All right. Now with this, the keyword here is sufficient. Okay, so take uh, John. Are you a powerlifter? Not really, but I've I've done like powerlifting training. Okay, cool. All right, well, we'll take Dennis. Dennis, who's a powerlifter. All right, and we'll take uh, Nicole. You're a CrossFitter. All right, so the John's the... pretty fucking strong. Just saying. Okay, cool. All right, John. We'll take John and we'll take Nicole. All right, two different sports. We'll say John's a powerlifter. Nicole's a CrossFitter. Their need for oxygen is going to be different. Okay. And when I say that, it's like your need of, of how much availability you need, uh, how fast you need to kind of replenish that it's completely different. Okay. But it needs to be sufficient for your sport. Okay. That's the the biggest underlying thing. All right. A lot of this concept of, we're going to dive into more talking about the heart and the lungs. We get wrapped around the axles of like, cool, I really need to train my heart and my lungs to be super strong and supply all this oxygen, but I'm a power lifter. It's like, okay, no, you just need to be sufficient at the task. But on the other end of the spectrum, the endurance athlete, no, you really need to train those things because you need a sufficient supply for the task that you're working. All right, so we've got the broad view. We've got the the lungs, they uptake and they expend oxygen. The heart is our pump. It transports blood, all right? And our muscles, like we know, is where our energy systems are and they express oxygen through our energy systems, all right? We inhale. All right, O2 is transported, O2 is then expressed, CO2 is produced, CO2 is transported, and then we exhale that CO2. All right, with this, now we know, all right, that our muscles need oxygen to contract. What does this mean to, and this could be a complex question, but what does that now mean to each and every one of you? Now you've learned that, oh, I need a sufficient supply of oxygen for the activities that I'm going to do. Now we're looking at, oh, is it as simple as just training my aerobic muscles or my anaerobic muscles or those systems? Or is there other things in the way that we actually need to think about as well when it comes to our training because of the sufficiency and the supply chain of oxygen here? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Mudge? So what are you, what are you asking exactly? 
So the question I'm asking, we've we've spoken about the systems, all right? So you've got your your aerobic system, your anaerobic system, lactic, alactic, whatever you want to call them, right? We know they exist. Mm -hmm. We know they exist at the muscle fibers. Okay, we know mm -hmm. we can train them in those different intensity or time domains that are that are prescribed there, and we know they're located in our muscles and the effects that different loads and different exercises might have on them due to the recruitment of fibers and the response of the nervous system. Okay, but we also know that oxygen needs to be sufficient for the athlete. Okay, so mm -hmm. we know we need oxygen here at the muscles and we know how to train those systems, but what do we actually need to have sufficiently working for oxygen to be present. So you need your heart and lungs to be working. Yeah. Efficiently. Okay. Exactly right. So, so this is kind of where that lens of, of aerobic, alactic, lactic can be overlooked a little bit because we can look at just training this system. Okay. But what, what might actually be the issue? The person might not be able to train their aerobic system because maybe their, their heart's not strong enough. All right. Their, their pump so to speak, is not strong enough to sufficiently supply oxygen, all right? And we could take a, a good example of, of uh, Jess. You said before you were training someone that uh, you were giving them an aerobic piece and they were feeling uh, like it was a bit more of an anaerobic piece, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, cool. So again, whatever this prescription was, maybe – what you did give them was an aerobic piece and the pacing was aerobic and it, and it looked all beautiful on paper, but maybe this or this wasn't sufficient enough to supply a continuous supply of oxygen to that muscle for it to be aerobic. All right. And that's just, a, again, it's not like you can be like, change your heart and do these kinds of things, change it. But there's other constraints we can put in place, all right, to now actually look at these two things being a limitation before we actually look at the muscular systems themselves. Cool. Uh, this comes back to limitations. So this is where we'll lead into a lot of our next call where we'll actually break down identifying these limitations all right, in different people, understanding um, someone who might present with a respiratory limitation. And I'll dive into a little bit more what that might look like and, and someone who might be uh, presenting in more of a delivery or a transport limitation. So the heart, for example, but we'll kind of talk about the main thing that affects them all. Who reckons they know what that's going to be? Dennis. I didn't see the next slide. <laughs> I didn't see it at all. You didn't see it. <laughs> Nadine, Nadine, answer it for me. What was on the next slide? I didn't see it. Oh, it was the nervous system. It was the nervous system. Well done, Nadine. <laughs> our nervous system is basically the the main uh the main limitation to all of these things, right? It's always and the reason for that is is what is our nervous system's job? It's its main priority. Who can tell me? David. Uh, would it be to regulate, uh, I guess, the body's response? Yes, that's that's a big part. Um, does anyone else want to have a have a crack? Uh, what about to just keep us alive? Yes. Yeah. Our nervous system's main job is to just essentially stop us from dying. All right. So all of these things that you feel when you train, when things start to hurt really bad, all right, when muscles start burning, it's it's not lactic acid. There's no acid. Okay. Yes, there are some metabolites and stuff within your system that are sending a response to your brain to be like, hey, we're going to do some damage here. I need you to slow down so we can preserve the organism. Okay. So yes. I, I just, just quickly, man, I think it'd be quite interesting to see how many of us here still think that lactic acid is the Bernie thing and that it's maybe not a good thing. Okay. Who, right. who, who thinks the lactic acid is the Bernie thing? No one, Dennis. <laughs> Holy shit. I'm the only, I'm the only idiot here. <laughs> it's a, it's okay. Look, it's, it's just because it's language, right? It's language that's been used for an extremely long time, all right? There's no acid. It's like if we had acid in our, I don't know, our system would probably not be a really good thing. We have acidity, but there's no actual lactic acid, okay? We just have lactate. And the interesting thing about lactate, right, is we're kind of digressing a little bit, but when does everyone know how they measure uh, lactate? 
Nicole, I'm sure you'd know. Um, is it through um like blood? Yeah, yeah. So there'll either yeah. be a, a blood prick on your finger or maybe they'll go to the back of the ear or the earlobe or something and they'll get a measurement um, of what your lactate levels are within your blood. And when we exercise, lactate levels do rise because this it, this happens in the breakdown of glycolysis. Lactate is produced. Okay, but one thing we forget as well, right? That measurement of lactate that we measure at the ear or the finger, okay? That is completely different to the level of lactate at the muscle. Let's just say um, the measurement, and I'll just use crude terms here, is is 50, all right? You, you measure a lactate level of 50, again, whatever that might be. When that was first produced at the muscle, that might've been 200. So where's the other 150 gone? Well, the other 150 has actually been shuttled and turned back into ATP. Okay, so is lactate actually a bad thing because it is used to now create more energy for us to use? So it's not actually a bad thing. It's actually a, a part of our energy systems to create more ATP. And there's a few other things that lactate actually does to help preserve the cell and keep us healthy, all right? You know, it, it helps things like um, uh, reactive oxygen species and, and, and stuff like that, which is basically a cancer cell. Um, but I digress. Lactate is a good thing. Okay, that burning sensation you feel, it is essentially, yes, there is a buildup of hydrogen ions and, and other byproducts, but it's essentially your nervous system saying, hey, if you keep going, something bad might happen. So we need to slow you down. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. And that is kind of the main effector for our energy systems. All right. And the nervous system affects pretty much everything. That's kind of all you need to understand. All right, now we're talking about other limitations. Um, we'll, we'll keep on the nervous system for a second, but when we start exercise, I know we spoke about before of the process of uh, muscle compression, venous occlusion, arterial occlusion, okay? Uh, but one of the main things that our nervous system does, obviously, to keep us alive is it regulates our blood pressure, right? So with that in mind, um, does everybody kind of understand uh, what blood pressure is? Uh, John, do you want to do you want to have a crack at telling everyone? Um, I honestly can't explain it in in terms more like um, complicated than it's just how like pressurized your your um, uh, like veins and, and arteries are. Yeah, essentially, exactly right. So we know our our arteries and our veins, right? They they contract and they expand. Okay, and our blood pressure is kind of one of those things that that affects that, so we can shuttle blood to where we actually need it. All right, when you think of this, right, it's like if all of our all of our uh, circulatory system was to expand at the same time, what would happen? Who who would want to have a guess of what would happen? Tiff, are you pointing at Dennis? <laughs> no one wants that. Much. What would happen? If our what if, was the question? If if our when we're talking about blood pressure and the effects of, mm -hmm. of what blood pressure actually does, what would happen if all of our circulatory system was to vasodilate or expand? Heart attack? You'd you'd maybe you probably wouldn't have a heart attack, Dennis. Do you know? An embolism or something. I'm all I'm thinking about right now is blowing up a balloon and I'm just not stopping like blowing into it. At some point it's gonna do something. Nicole, yeah. what's it going to do? So do you mean if, if your blood pressure just gets very low? Yeah, if, if, it, if, it, if it just went and just plummeted, what's going to happen? And you just collapse. Yeah, you, you'd collapse. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly right. You'd, you'd collapse, you'd pass out, and if it was to stay extremely low for a long period of time, you'd probably die, Okay. And that's because what our blood pressure is doing is there's things that are squeezing or, or um, contracting or vasoconstricting, we could say. And there's also things that are vasodilating. And those little things that are happening are controlled by our nervous system. And that's what's shuttling blood to where we need it, whether it's we need it to contract, whether we need it to go to our vital organs to keep us alive. It's kind of happening continuously all throughout. And this is the main effector of what affects um our, our uh, energetic response, okay? And we can kind of go through that response right now. So when we start exercise, all right, we have something called metabolic vasodilation. 
Okay, so when you start doing, uh, let's just say you jump on a bike and you start pedaling your legs, okay, all of those muscles that are now working and they're being recruited by our nervous system are vasodilating. Okay, that is so more blood can go to that area to feed it with oxygen so we can create ATP and we can create energy. Okay, that is that is what happens. But what happens elsewhere, all right, as we can see here, we have sympathetic vasoconstriction, all right, in skeletal muscles that aren't working or aren't being recruited. Let's say you're on a bike and you're just pedaling. You probably don't need your pecs that much unless, I don't know, you're hanging on for dear life. The blood in those things, all right, or the or the 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 innovations that are going to those muscles and the, the the supplying blood to those muscles, they're going to constrict, okay, so blood can be shuttled to where it's needed within the body, okay. So we don't need to use our chest as much. We want not. We want all this blood going to our legs. Or our nervous system is going to be like, cool. I'm going to close those pipes, so to say, so more blood can be shuttled to the legs. All right, and this is so we can have all that blood going to our legs, but we can also maintain blood all right, within our vital organs as well. If we were trying to go, I want blood in my non-working muscles, my vital organs, and my working muscles, we'd probably start to see that blood pressure start to drop, whereas we want to keep that blood pressure high. All right, then we have an onset of muscle compression. That's when the work starts starts happening a little bit harder. Then we go through venous occlusion, all right, which is where the working skeletal muscle, all right, is now starting to occlude. We're starting to get a little bit of a pumping sensation. And then say we go to arterial occlusion, where we completely fail and we can no longer get fresh blood to that muscle and we have to stop. Contraction completely stops. That doesn't happen because of your ability all right to to contract or your your strength or your weakness or whatever like i said that is your nervous system stopping that from happening to protect you so what is happening there is your muscles are working so damn hard right now to pull more fresh oxygen all right to keep you working and to keep you contracting while at the same time it's trying to expel all that co2 think about that cycle that we went through before but now what is happening is we can't deliver more blood to that area because we still need what's left, all right, to to get our keep our working, uh, our sorry, our organs and our vital functions working, all right. So what happens is our nervous system has to have this response of, I need to shut that that shit down essentially, or we're going to pass out, or something worse is going to happen. All right, so that's why that failure occurs in the, in the long run. That failure occurs is our skeletal muscle has has outstripped or it's 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 outdone our cardiac output so we can no longer supply blood to that area while maintaining blood pressure so that's why we fail all right there's no run out of anything we don't run out it's basically just a response of our nervous system trying to stop us from blacking out okay anybody have any questions on that that's rather complex dennis you're laughing yeah yeah john so do we reach arterial occlusion every time we take a muscle to failure close yes yeah yeah there's a there's a few things that going as i said that muscle compression is the start you will get pretty damn close to to arterial occlusion but usually most of us uh and this is just from my experience by using things like moxie and measuring on it uh, measuring on people we usually stop pretty much maybe just after that that sort of venous occlusion response because venous occlusion is actually quite uncomfortable full arterial occlusion is like um, like full, full, like pretty much zero is like if you were to tourniquet your arm and start doing some like, you know, um, maybe if you do BFR stuff, you've seen BFR work before, yeah. that could be pretty damn close, all right, to the side of arterial occlusion. Um, and we can get close to that. Say you're just doing a, a horrific set of bicep curls. Um, we could get there or a horrific set of war balls or something. You know, when your quads just stopped working, um, we can get close, but it's will never really go to zero because our body will save us essentially before we can get to that point of zero. Okay. So just to if I can ask a follow up. Yeah, of course. Let's say someone's like doing a set of bicep curls yep. and they like hit failure. Like they can't, uh, they can't fully bring the dumbbell up all mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. um, how does that relate to like this um, like diagram here? Like what stage have you, you reached to? Yeah. To so, so uh, you're probably around this stage here be somewhere in this this point of venous occlusion and arterial occlusion 
Okay. Cause also what happens, um, we also have a, an effector. All right. So, uh, this kind of comes more in terms of like, uh, accessory work and, and bodybuilding. We do have an effect of the muscle pump itself. So the muscle pump is basically when our muscle does get pumped up and full of blood, what happens with that, that venous occlusion, like I said, uh, blood, fresh blood can get in. All right. But no, blood can get out all right that's our venous occlusion okay so what's happening when that that keeps happening our muscle is filling and filling and filling and that now starts squeezing down all right on our uh on our circulatory system and that's kind of what's starting to cause that pumped out sensation all right and that eventuating into arterial occlusion so there's no blood getting in there's no blood getting out so now we can't actually contract anymore because we don't have any what Oxygen coming in. Oxygen, exactly, because we've gone to that point, all right? So that's kind of where it comes to it. That's why you might see, take an endurance athlete, for example. Maybe you've experienced this. You take an endurance athlete and you take a, let's say, a bodybuilder. That bodybuilder might get a pump extremely quickly, whereas that endurance athlete might just be like, nah, man, I'm just not, like, I can do this all day, all right? Because they have an extreme strong cardiac output, all right, that's fighting against that that arterial occlusion or that venous occlusion much better or more sufficiently than the bodybuilder because of their their heart essentially. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody have any questions on this so far? Uh, is there a difference in how this presents itself for that endurance athlete when they're conducting an endurance based activity such as you know I'm just going for a run or something mm -hmm. you know at a, at a high intensity. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so a similar thing um, will happen if you're going for a run at a high intensity, eventually what's going to happen is like I said before, if we're going all out and we're maxing out at some point with anything, our, our demand for oxygenated blood at the working muscle will always eventually outstrip our cardiac output. It always will. Uh, and when I say outstrip, it'll outwork our cardiac output. So there will always be a point of where your heart can no longer keep up with the demands that your muscle is asking for that continuous oxygenated blood if you're working at a high intensity, okay? The only way to to fix that or get better with that is to increase cardiac output, all right? Does that make sense? Yeah, cheers. Yeah, that answers the question. Um, did you have a question, Nicole? I saw you doing something. Yeah, yeah, I was actually going to ask um, people who do like blood flow restriction training, would they be in the arterial occlusion? Yes. Yeah, they'd, or, yeah. yeah they'd definitely yeah. Be, be up there with that. They'd be, yeah. be close to that. And that's just basically all they'd be doing is their, uh, that muscle pump that I spoke about of, of when that blood does swell all right, up the area and cause slight restrictions. Again, it doesn't swell to a point of where everything closes off. It doesn't happen. But we get we can get pretty close. Um, that BFR cuff or BFR essentially just expediates that process. All right, and with BFR there, there are some benefits there in terms of you know it can create responses of a higher metabolic stress and higher levels of metabolic stress. Now it can help with things like motor unit recruitment. All right, and motor unit recruitment is is an essential for hypertrophy. So there can be some benefits there, but also it's probably a very small one too it's it's quite they're quite good in the sense of rehab of people who can't lift lots of loads um but in terms of like a healthy person it's maybe not necessary cool all right so the common effector is the nervous system and within conditioning the main thing that that it's trying to affect is our blood pressure to to keep us alive that's that's kind of the big thing there all right so we'll go to the lungs the lung effectors and this is our limitations as as a as an athlete so obviously we spoke about the nervous system there. We also have the respiratory muscles. Okay. Like we know when we breathe, we inhale and exhale for some people, these can actually be a limiter in, in how much oxygen they can actually inhale and how much they can actually exhale to all right, uptake that oxygen. So we can actually deliver or transport it to our working muscles. All right. So this is kind of where we start to see that it's not just training those three systems or those three different types of muscle fibers. We might actually have to look at the processes of how we get oxygen to those fibers. 
All right, and our lungs can affect that. And a big one at the start we can think about is anatomical structure here. So if we think back to the start when when Dennis was talking about structure, all right, who wants to talk to me about what what he was saying about the extended extension of powerlifters and how you might think that would affect lungs or our lungs in terms of our uptake of oxygen? Tyrrell, do you remember that? Yep, sorry. Um, no, you're right, yeah, you're just you're referring to in that um, overextended position, yeah, and just how how your how your body's able to take in uh, oxygen. Yes, yes, yeah, correct. So that could potentially be a limitation. So let's just say, for example, and again, like I said, we'll dive into these later on. Someone comes to you for training, right, and they've had an extensive background in strength training, and they are like this. They are they are super extended, all right, and they they struggle. In, in conditioning or cardio workouts, all right? And you're just like, cool, we just got to do more cardio. We just got to smash this person with more cardio and more aerobic work. It's like, yes, that, that might be the case and that might actually have an effect. But are there other things we can do, all right, to potentially manipulate structure, all right, to help this person's lungs, all right, uptake oxygen for them to be able to transport it and express it in a, in a faster or more efficient way? And again, we'll talk about more of how to actually affect these things in the in the next um, the next uh, call. Does that make sense to everyone in terms of those three things for the lungs? Could awesome. could you give us some examples of of you know what you could do to I guess downregulate to be able to express those qualities? Uh, we will in the next module. Oh yeah. <laughs> the next one will dive into more so like programming, identifying these limitations, and how to actually train them. Uh, the next one is our heart. All right. We obviously spoke about the effectors of the nervous system on the heart and our regulation of um, blood pressure. Okay. That's the biggest one for the heart. But the other one is heart structure. Okay. Now, this is a, a bit of a difficult one. Again, none of us as coaches are going to be like, hey, man, I need a measurement of your heart. It's like, it's not going to happen. Okay. But there are things that we can assume and imply within training that could help develop our heart structure in a way that is going to be more sufficient for the athlete. All right. Who can, uh, does anyone have a, I guess, an idea of what I'm saying when I say changing heart structure to help the delivery or the, the circulatory system deliver blood? Could that be like uh, size? Uh, so yep. of, of the heart itself? Yep. Yep. Cool. Size of the heart. John, did you, do you have something there? Yeah. I was going to say size of uh, left ventricle. Yep. Yep. Why the left one? I don't actually know. I just know that's, that's what gets trained when you do like, um like low intensity cardio. Yeah. Cool. All right. And, and that's a really important one to, to think about what the actual heart or what you're trying to achieve with an aerobic session, right? It's like, you might be like, yeah, cool. I'm just giving them this aerobic piece to get them fitter, but maybe now explaining to them of the importance of why they need to go so slow, okay, to get that left ventricular filling, all right, which causes that stretch, all right, on that side of the heart. And it's actually called um, Frank Starling Law is what that's called. And, and essentially what that means is, and this is where CrossFit messes up aerobic training severely, okay, because we, let's take this, this uh, case study, for example, all right, when we're doing a workout, let's just say we've got some rowing and we've got some heavy thrusters or something. And you're just like, this is your aerobic piece for today. It's going to go for like 30 minutes or something. And you're just going to continue cycling through these movements. They're going nice and chill on the row. They're getting a really good return of blood to the heart, but then they go over to the thrusters and they're getting a bit gassed. They're getting a little bit of a pump. Okay. What is that pump doing? Who can tell me when they're getting that pump in like the arms and the legs? What's that stopping from happening? Oxygen uh, getting in and out. Yeah. So it's stopping the return of oxygen or the return of blood to the heart. Now, when it comes to aerobic training and training the heart itself, we want to maximize the amount of blood returning to the heart for this thing that's called Frank Starling law to occur. All right. The more blood that actually returns to the heart, the larger, all right, that left ventricle, like you were saying, stretches. All right. The larger that thing stretches, it's like an elastic band. What happens when you stretch an elastic band? It creates tension, right? And you let it go, it expels more. All right. That's what happens when we get a large amount of ventricular filling, all right? It expands more and then it lets go. And that actually forces a higher cardiac output. 
And over time, that's what we're trying to train with those lower sessions. But now we know that's what we're trying to train. We're going to keep the load in the exercises we choose really low because we want as much blood to return to the heart as possible. We don't want it getting pulled or stuck in certain areas because we are causing that that occlusion at the muscles, stopping blood from returning. All right. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Cool. Anything to add on that one, Mooj? No, mate. It's perfect. All right. Cool, man. Awesome. And the last one are our muscle effectors. Okay. So this is one we would dive into a lot. And I know you were speaking about it, uh, or Dennis was speaking about it before when it comes to tension. Tension is a huge one of how tension in our nervous system and the tension our muscles hold actually affects our ability within our, our fitness or fitness, let's say, our conditioning, our cardio, our energetic training, whatever you want to call it, muscle tension is a really large effector. And we will dive into that in, in a lot of depth um, into the, the, next, um, the next thing. Hang on, I've got a message in the chat. We're forgetting this chat exists. I don't know where it is. All right, cool. Fiber type, we've spoken about that. Okay, so the the amount of fibers people have. Again, this is not something we can test. A lot of these things you will see, we, we can't actually test. But again, we, and we'll dive into this again next time. But when someone comes to us, what do you first do? Like if you have a client that comes to you uh, and they sit down, they're like, hey, I want to train. Tyrrell, what do, you, what do you do when you get someone that's new and they just come to you and start ask, talking to you they want training? Uh, me personally, I uh, yep. would probably just first, firstly go over their goals and what they're, yep. what they're looking at getting out of training. Mm -hmm. uh, did you want me to keep going? And yeah, yeah, 100%. Next? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, apart from like the information I gather with, you know, history and... Yep. Um, yeah, cool. I'll stop you there. Yeah. You yeah. said that the main one there, history, right? So it's yeah. like when we, when we, you know, take on a new client or a new person, we, we ask them, what have they been doing prior? Like, what is their training history? And just this underlying knowledge alone, okay, can give us a lot of information of how they might present to us and the certain limitations that they might have in terms of like, you know, their their limitations of their, you know, muscle tension, for example, if they've come from a high tensile sport of, of powerlifting and they're like, I want to run a marathon. Well, I can assume pretty well that they're going to hold a whole lot of muscle tension and I'm going to have to affect that in a way. Okay. That's just an example. But Getting our training history, which we'll talk about more, is going to be a really large one when it comes to building out these archetypes of, of uh, structure and function that, that people that come to us and then how we can affect that later on, okay? Uh, the last bit of muscle effectors are obviously, like I said, fiber type. This coming in, someone comes to me like a large powerlifting background, zero endurance training, but they want to do endurance training. I can assume... All right, like Dennis was saying earlier, maybe they are in a little bit more of a sympathetic state, okay? So maybe they're going to be a little bit more predisposed, okay, to recruiting those type 2 A and B fibers over those type 1 fibers. Again, this is assumptions, but they give us a good starting point, all right? And they give us a little bit more to now make an effect on than just going, I'm just going to give them a whole bunch of aerobic training, all right? All right, circulatory system, again, tension affects this thing. All right, like I was saying before, the muscle pump, all right, how fast a muscle pumps up or fatigues will affect our circulatory system. So we need to find ways to reduce that tension. All right, and then our anatomical structure itself. Like I said, that extended position, the structure that we went over at the start. So all of these things, all right, affect our muscle's ability when it comes to energetic training. All right, so to wrap things up, Okay, now we look at this little, uh, I guess, diagram of energy systems. Again, it's not wrong and it's not wrong to use it. But what do you now think about when you look at this? Who can tell me? Let's go, Jess. Can you repeat the question? I'm going to go with more John this one with the goldfish brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. When you look at this now, after everything that we've gone through, Again, this is not wrong, okay? Mm. This is still fine and it still has a lot of merit and it still can be used. But when you look at this now, after everything we've just spoken about, what do you think about? Um, 
I feel like I've got a much bigger picture than just what's in front of me. And especially yep. that you've touched on um, the heart, um, training that at a sort of a lower rate to, I guess, train other systems. Mm -hmm. So we're like wanting to train aerobic, I'd say this client that I was talking about, um, training them at a lower rate to build on the heart is actually going to help him in mm. his anaerobic and his lactic that yeah. it's going to build across that because you're building that capacity and yeah. it's not you can't just look at that and say well i'm going to put that person in like high intensity for 10 seconds and that's their lactic it's like well what's their structure what's their heart what's their ability to get oxygen into their body um it's just yeah it's completely widened the view um, yeah blowing my mind completely <laughs> <laughs> so again it, it's one of these things there is a lot more to look at and i don't want to overwhelm and confuse and it does seem like that i'm sure but the whole idea around all of these other underlying things is to give you a lens so you can now look at training with your clients and things like that is there is there is more than just going ah oh, this person's not very cardio fit so i'm just going to give them a whole bunch of aerobic training well it's like there's other things that we can identify and look at which we'll go into um that could also affect these and you could also have an effect on within their training um nicole what do kind of you think about when you look at this now yeah i guess it's it's really important as you touched on structure and how to get oxygen into the body especially because there's there is we can't train without oxygen. There's oxygen present in every um, time domain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's quite important. Cool. Awesome. All right. So into our last slide here, uh, traditional versus contemporary. Again, the side of what I've been talking about, a lot of it is contemporary in it's a lot of different things um, and looking very, very deeply into this traditional model. And again, it's, it's quite complex when you first understand and first start to look at it. But when you do fully start to grasp and understand these things, all it does is it gives you a, a simpler lens to then be like, cool, I've got this person. This is how they're presenting to me. These are the things that I might need to address instead of just going and looking at that, that chart and going, I need aerobic work. There's some aerobic work. Let's see how it goes. All right. Now you've got a more of a holistic picture of other things that we can look at. All right. And in our next, our next, um, what do they call it? Wow, our next module. All right. As I said, this was just all the underlying stuff. So I'd like to say more of it's the the boring, nerdy side of things. In the next module, we're going to be discussing more about how do we identify these limitations within people or within our clients. Uh, how do we then affect them? Okay, and then. What does training look like around things like adding in conditioning and strength and, you know, how does that affect structure? How does that affect tension? Diving into all those little things, okay? That's kind of what the next module is going to look like. And then the following or the final week before our Q&A, it will be diving into like programming and testing and, and all those kinds of things about how we can actually put it together for a person that whether they want to just do fitness training or a bit of, bit of conditioning or fitness stuff within their strength training itself or cardio, whatever you want to call it, and give you those tools as well. All right, so that wraps up today. We have uh, gone over a whole lot of information. Um, does anybody have any questions before we jump off? No, no one's got any questions. Uh, where are we? Just before we do head off, um, yes. if I do have questions that arise, and then uh, I'm pretty forgetful as well, so I don't know if I'll remember it um, mm -hmm. before the next module. Um, is it okay just to pop it in the Instagram, or should I just note it down and then just nah, chuck it in? Chuck it in the Instagram, man. I I, I definitely lo love that. And whether we chatted about chat about it there, or it can again yeah. give me stuff to touch on when we get to. Um, actually diving into things as well. I know a few people have asked about, you know, training CrossFit athletes, training rugby uh, players, things like that. And there will be things in our, in our programming modules that can touch on that stuff as well. Yeah. You just come better prepared if you have more. Yeah, it, exactly. Right. Um, Nadine, how did you go with all of that? I know, I know you're uh, you're not a coach or anything, so it's probably a lot of information, but how, how did that go? How, how are you, how are you feeling? Not too overwhelmed, I hope. I know it was great, but of course there's a lot of new uh, information. So yeah, yeah. Again, I need if you to look everything up. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'll put this in the in the like this recording. I'll put this in the the chat itself. But again, if you have any questions moving forward, um, please let me know as well. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you. All right. 
Well, that wraps up today, guys. So thank you all for coming along. Um, again, if there are any questions before we jump off, please let me know. But that is essentially the the complex, I'm going to say the most complex stuff that we're going to cover kind of out there now. And we will relay back and forth between some of it in the next modules. Um, this is just more the underlying stuff that we need to have. You don't need to have an in and out understanding, but this will just help you when I start talking about things in the next couple of modules. You can go, oh, he's talking about the nervous system there, or he's talking about you know the limitations of oxygen due to the heart or something like that. So this is to help give you that underlying information. Okay, If you have any questions on anything, please let me know. Um, but again, thank you so much for, for all coming out uh, tonight and giving me your time. Appreciate you all. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. Cheers, Thank guys. you. Thanks, Louis. Thank you. Fuck you, Louis. <laughs>